Hi, Rote friends. Welcome to Classics in Color, your weekly dive into some of the ancient world's wackiest facts. I'm Mark Graves, and today we're going to be examining the question of who would have won in a fight, the ancient Roman or the ancient Chinese military. I have not spent as much time on military tech and history as I have on other subjects, and I know next to nothing about Chinese history and Chinese military, so I am very reliant on a really fascinating article that I found for this video. So that's what everything here is based off of. The name of the article is An Ancient Military Contact Between Romans and Chinese, and the author is one Homer H. Dubs. Before we get started, unlike normal, I do have to kind of explain some things about this article. So when I first started skimming it, just to see if it was gonna be useful or interesting, almost right away I hit this sentence. So it says, just as the Romans conquered the whole Mediterranean, which is fine, so the Chinese in the Han period conquered all the worthwhile parts of their world. And when I hit that word worthwhile, I thought, Hmm, that has that has kind of an unpleasant taste to it. What, what do you mean worthwhile? Aren't, isn't all of China worthwhile? It seems a little strange. Maybe I'm overthinking it. I don't know. Let me know. Uh, but that made me want to go check the publication date. And <laughs> sure enough, this was published in 1942. So we can see definitely not a very sensitive word choice at the least. And I don't know about you all, but I find it strangely amusing when I'm reading old books and articles to come across these just random bits of insensitive language sprinkled in. I don't know why, but I find it kind of funny, but I thought I would bring it up just so you know, A, this is an old article, so bring your grains of salt, and two, hopefully we can all kind of share a laugh at this guy's expense that he just has this very antiquated, insensitive uh, word choice and world of view. With all of those qualifications noted, though, he still uses plenty of primary resources, both Roman and Chinese, and those seem to be perfectly credible and fine. So for better or worse, we're gonna plow ahead, starting with the Chinese side of things. So in about 36 BC, there was a fellow whose name, I believe, is just pronounced Qi Qi, corrections if necessary, please, who was a Hun and set up a small city-state in Western China. He began exerting influence over the surrounding area, exacting tribute, that kind of thing. And at the same time, there was a Chinese general who noticed this was going on and felt threatened by it. His name, I believe, is Chen Tang, and he got permission to launch an attack against this guy, Chi Chi, to sort of cut him off at the knees before he accumulated too much power. And there is an account of this attack in the Chinese history, which is called History of the Former Han Dynasty, and it was written in about 111. 11 AD. In this history, there is one line about this attack that is potentially really intriguing. So I'm just using the translation in the article, but it says something like when the Chinese army had marched up on the city, outside of the city, there were more than a hundred foot soldiers lined up on either side of the gate in a fish scale formation. Now, that modifier fish scale seems to be the real key nugget that Dubs builds the rest of his argument, the rest of this article, off of. He seems to think that this means there have to have been Romans here, that this is proof positive that the Chinese and the Romans fought at one point. And he makes some good arguments. One, that in order for soldiers to be in any kind of like tight, organized formation, they're probably gonna be full-time, they're gonna be professionals, this isn't just gonna be a militia, some farmers that you conscripted over the weekend, right? These are gonna be trained professionals. And the Romans at this point in history are definitely trained professionals. They fit that bill. Second off, in order to get that fish scale formation, you have to have a particular kind of shield. So for example, let's look at hoplite Greek shields, right? These are little round things. They cannot protect a whole person. They wouldn't really work for if you wanted to overlap a bunch of them to protect a whole bunch of men just doesn't really work. But if you look at Roman shields, there are these nice big rectangular things that can protect a whole person and that can definitely interlock very well. You could line a whole bunch of them up and you can imagine it looking very much like fish scales. And finally, the Romans are famous for these tight formations that they make with their shields. 
one of their signature moves is called the testudo, and that's where they all link their shields up around the edges of their formation, but also overhead. And testudo basically means tortoise, so they look kind of like a tortoise. They have this shell over their whole squadron, and they can march protected like that. So I will admit that this passage does sound an awful like an awful lot like we're talking about Romans. Your next question might reasonably be, but even if it sounds kind of like Romans, why would there be a hundred Romans randomly in this city? There probably isn't a good reason for that, right? Well, there is potentially actually a reason that Dobbs provides. So he points out that in 54 BC, there was a gentleman named Crassus, using the term gentleman loosely, <laughs> who uh, was a general for Rome and marched a whole bunch of Roman soldiers against the Parthians. The Parthians at this point in time had an empire kind of between Rome and China. So it was just sort of on the Eastern edge of Rome. So he marches against them and it doesn't go very well. Let's check out a passage from Plutarch. At first they purposed to charge upon the Romans with their long spears and throw their front ranks into confusion. But when they saw the depth of their formation, where shield was locked with shield, and the firmness and composure of the men, they drew back. And while seeming to break their ranks and disperse, they surrounded the hollow square in which their enemies stood before he was aware of the maneuver. And when Crassus ordered his light-armed troops to make a charge, they did not advance far, but encountering a multitude of arrows, abandoned their undertaking and ran back for shelter among the men-at-arms, among whom they caused the beginning of disorder and fear. For these now saw the velocity and force of the arrows which fractured armor and tore their way through every covering alike, whether hard or soft." So in this passage, we see the classic use of that interlocking shields formation, and we also see the Romans get their asses handed to them. It does not end well at all. But Plutarch then goes on to add something interesting. Of the 42,000 who had set out with Crassus, scarcely one-fourth escaped. 20,000 were slain and 10,000 were made prisoners. The Parthians moved these Roman prisoners to Margiana to guard their eastern front. So from this we see that there were a whole bunch of Romans that were taken captive by the Parthians and then used specifically for their military abilities, used as mercenaries. And obviously after this the Romans don't hear much from or about these guys, but the Roman poet Horace guesses that they probably assimilated into their new culture. They probably married in, he calls them barbarian women, but he, they married into the local culture and that they continued to serve the Parthian armies. And this city that they were stationed at allegedly is about 500 miles from where Chi Chi City is. So it's a bit of a stretch, but it's not impossible to think that he might have recruited them as mercenaries to come and defend his city. And if you look at the fortifications for this city, they are basically a double palisade, which again is not a classic Hun or Chinese strategy. This is a classic Roman thing to do with our Roman engineering. And so that makes it not only possible, but kind of likely that there were Romans at this city. So the question we have all been waiting for, if we assume that these really are Romans here fighting off against the Chinese, what happened? Who won? Well, in the Chinese account of the battle, the Chinese kicked ass. <laughs> there was no question. This was a decisive victory and allegedly they were able to win so easily because they brought these giant crossbows. So it allowed them to stay out of range of their enemies bows and it allowed them to tear through their enemies, including those fish scale warriors. So they just wiped out the entire city. That Chinese history though does include one final intriguing detail. It says that they took 145 prisoners back to China with them. If you know anything about Roman armies, you know they tend to come in batches of 100, so it's possible <laughs> that these prisoners were Roman, but they don't say anything about that. They don't say whether the they were these intriguing fish scale warriors, but that would be pretty neat if there were a band of Roman soldiers that got to go all the way to the Chinese Empire and see that, but we'll never know. Thank you so much for sticking through that whole video. Special thank you as always to subscribers and to Patreon members. And I hope to see all of you again next week. Carry time.